That was a thrilling game, a thrilling victory. I don't know if you could call it a feel-good win, but regardless, it's now a best of three. Kylan Mills and I are going to break down the post-game action next. This is Locked On Warriors. You are Locked On Warriors, your daily Golden State Warriors podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you for making Locked On Warriors your first listen every day. We're free and available wherever you get podcasts. And actually, that script is updated. I haven't memorized it yet because we're also available on YouTube, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Today's episode is brought to you by Prize Picks. Today, uh, first time users can receive a 100% instant deposit match up to $100 with the promo code Locked On. That's prizepicks.com. Use the promo code Locked on. You can follow Kylan Mills on all social media platforms, including Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter at Kylan Mills. You can follow me, Cyrus Sotsis, on Twitter at Dog Surf Rocho. Kylan, that was wild. That is, it was an edge of your seat thriller of a game. I'm sure anyone watching was thoroughly entertained. I don't know how how good you could feel about it if you're a Warriors fan, but nonetheless, the series is tied. It's a best of three. Great to see you. Your immediate reaction, Kylan, to a thrilling game four victory for the Golden State Warriors. Uh, yeah, it was thrilling. I'm just still waiting for my blood pressure to go down. I don't know about anybody <laughs> else, but like my heart was pounding out of my chest. I was sweating and I just get like that. I don't know if anyone else like I could have nothing to do with the game. But if I'm watching like a clutch moment or like a close, you know, play at the buzzer, I'm like, Ooh, and it's even worse when it's the oh. Warriors. So I was just on the absolute edge of my seat. Uh, would have liked to see the Warriors close it out stronger. Um, I mean, I think it's huge. You got to take the win when you can get the win. This was a hard fought game, a game of runs. I was really impressed with the way the Warriors came out in the third quarter. And that to me was the difference in this game. And the reason why they were able to pull out this win, a lot of areas to improve in the first half. And I thought they yeah. really made some nice adjustments played which with much more intensity uh, defensively, they were able to string together stops in that third quarter. The ball was flying around. The movement was great offensively. They were crashing the glass. I just thought they looked out. They looked reinvigorated in the third quarter. And to me, that was what <laughs> allowed them to squeak out this win. But you would like to see some better fourth quarter execution from the Warriors down the stretch. Kevon Looney can't throw a pass away, uh, you know, with less than two minutes to go, chucking it up court. There were just a couple of costly turnovers that if they could have cleaned up, I think they would have closed out this game much more comfortably. And then obviously the Steph Curry play, I'm sure we'll talk more about, but Steph improperly calling that timeout when they did, the dubs didn't have one could have ended up, you know, being the loss that could have ended up deciding the game. So thankfully uh, Harrison Barnes missed that last shot because otherwise this game would have in large part been on Steph Curry. I don't think you can only put up, put it on him because again, I think there were some other areas of fourth quarter execution. The dubs could have improved on, but still, if he doesn't falsely call that timeout, I think the dubs would have cruised and we all would have had a few less gray hairs going on, uh, <laughs> but we'll take it. You'll take the win. Now, you know, it's gotta be one game at a time from here on out. The Warriors have to win one road game. That's it. They have not been a great road team all season, but you just need one now. So they go uh, back to Sacramento. If they can win this next game, game five, Warriors take it in six. I feel confident of that. If they split the next two games, this is going to come down to a game seven, win or go home. And the Warriors just have to come up with one game of brilliance in an opposing court. Yeah, that's what it comes down to. It's now a best of three. Uh, game five will be absolutely pivotal. Um, I, you know, one thing I'm thinking of right now is all of a sudden there is a lot of pressure on the Kings. Um, I feel like it's the first time this entire series where the Kings are feeling pressure because if they don't win game five, you're talking about a young team going into chase center for game six against the defending world champions. I don't think the Sacramento Kings can handle that. I, I really do feel game five for them is a must win. That is a massive advantage for the Warriors going into Golden One Center, a team that has struggled on the road all season. Uh, your thoughts on game five? I guess I might as well just start there just because We'll break the whole game down. There was a lot to touch on. But game five, your thoughts, Kylan? Uh, I mean, this is going to be a huge test for the Warriors. They should now, 
it's a little bit of a catch-22 because this was not the way the Warriors wanted to close out this game. But at the end of the day, they got the win, and they're going to come into Game 5 with the momentum of winning both games at Chase Center. Um, so like you said, and especially with the Kings jumping up to a two-game lead early in the series, the pressure is now on Sacramento to perform. And once again, you're looking at a young team who has not been in this position before. Yeah. They have shown up in every single way when the pressure has been on them until, honestly, this last shot to close out this game here. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I think that for a young team, they've done really well and they've responded in those pressure situations especially in games one and two they look like the more you know veteran team the Warriors did based on their execution Um, but I think we're starting to see a little bit of the cracks in the armor because this is still a young group that has not experienced this so this is a situation where the Warriors can absolutely take advantage in game five they come in with a team with more experience they have the momentum of winning these last two games at Chase Center although game four wasn't pretty it was a win and to me this is where they need to capitalize and something that Draymond Green said on his podcast leading up to this series was that they have to instill doubt in the Kings. They have to jump on them early. And I think that that statement doesn't become any more true than it does in game five of the series. Now coming in split two and two with the Warriors come in, having won the last two games heading on the road. If the Warriors can jump out early, play really strong in the fourth quarter, I think that will instill some doubt in these Kings players' minds about whether or not they can actually beat the Golden State Warriors in a seven-game series. And that's what you want to do because once that seed of doubt starts to creep in, it can be very, very difficult to come back and play with the confidence the Kings have been playing with, especially early in the season. I thought they really responded well today uh, to their Game 3 loss. The Kings looked much better. I thought they came out and were really playing hard, especially in the first half. They got the better run of play. Mm -hmm. Um, But now I think if the Warriors can jump out in Game 5, really come out playing great defense decisively, crashing the boards, more of what they did in Game 3, I think they can instill some of that doubt and really finish off the Kings in Game 5 because I think if the Warriors win Game 5, Game 6 is coming. I totally agree. That's why, you know... uh... I, I'm, this is not me underestimating the Kings by any regard, but they are an unex, inexperienced team. Very few players on that roster have a uh, postseason experience. And, um, you know, you see, so if they don't win game five, I, I don't see how the Kings are going to pull off this series. Um, I do think for them, it's a must win. And that's just an added advantage that the Warriors have to take advantage of. I do not want to see this series going to a game seven where anything could happen. Um, but Kyle, I don't know. I don't, you tell me what I'm, I'm debating which subject to start with first. I guess let's start with this. Draymond Green was missing in game three, so was Gary P in the second. We, I was a little surprised to see him come in the game in, in this one as well. We weren't sure what his status was until very last minute. He plays as well. Draymond Green, I thought, despite the fact that he had a very poor shooting night, um, I thought he made a three, but the box score is showing he was zero for two, which means that one that he made was a his foot was probably on the line. Uh, but a poor shooting night, three for 14, 0 for two from beyond the arc, uh, but 12 points grabbed 10 pivotal rebounds. I mean, he was in there, uh, grabbing some tough ones, battling inside with some bonus battling inside at times with Alex Len. Um, what were you, what was your uh, thoughts on Draymond Green? I thought that the, the, the mental warfare he had, uh, with Deer and Fox early in the game where they're John back and forth. I'm always going to love seeing Draymond do that because he wins those mental battles. When he starts doing that, he's getting in the head of the opposition. A brilliant adjustment by by Mike Brown to pull De'Aaron Fox immediately out of the game at that moment, which I thought was very uh, smart for him to do just because, again, opposing players don't win that. Uh, A huge reason why the the Golden State Warriors are a dynasty, why they've won four titles, is because of Draymond Green – getting inside the heads of opposing players. He just knows how to do it. He knows how to uh, eat at their craw, uh, distract them. Um, it was a, it was fascinating to watch De'Aaron Fox uh, give him credit for, for keeping his composure, having a solid fourth quarter. Uh, your reaction, though, just to Draymond Green's first game back, which I thought personally, despite the shooting woes, uh, three for 14 from the field, uh, I thought he still had a brilliant performance when he considered how, how fantastic he was defensively uh, and playing inside. Your thoughts? Uh, yeah, so I had the complete opposite reaction of you, uh, Cyrus, to Draymond jarring early on in the game um, with De'Aaron Fox. My initial thought was, oh no, dear God, I was holding my breath. Draymond, do not say anything stupid. Do not cross the line. Do not tick off these referees early in this game and have it come back to bite you. Uh, I think coming off that suspension, how harshly the NBA came down on Draymond Green, he needed to be on his absolute best behavior in this game. So I was nervous early on when he was jarring with De'Aaron Fox because you just don't know 
what's the one thing that could potentially set off one of these referees because these refs and especially the crew that was there tonight, they've been calling the series very tightly. As we've seen, they have not been giving the Warriors anything and especially not Draymond Green. He's not going to get the benefit of the doubt in any situation. So to me, that's an area where Draymond has to be really careful early in the game. Do not set off the referees. Do not do something that's going to end up hurting you down the stretch of the game. Um, So that was one of my initial thoughts to that specific instance that you brought up was like, I was like, Dre, try to rein it in. Do not do anything stupid. Um, just make sure that you don't do something to take yourself out of this game and recognize what the situation is that you're in and that these referees are going to look for anything and that no one's going to be on your side at this point. We saw how the NBA reacted to what I thought was an unnecessary suspension that was doled yeah. down regarding that last, obviously, the whole incident with Sabonis. Um, moving cool. along from that, though, I thought that Draymond Green played outstanding defensively. Yes, he had didn't have a great shooting game, but – He was a big reason why the Warriors came out and played so strong in the third quarter. Steve Kerr made the adjustments at halftime to start Draymond Green. He didn't start the game, but he started the second half, and I think that was one thing that made a difference because he was able to contain at least a little bit De'Aaron Fox. Starting out the game, the Warriors couldn't do anything to shut down De'Aaron Fox, and credit to him, he was so, so quick. So fun to watch. An explosive player, also really strong in the mid-range. I mean, he had some great touch on some middies. Um, In the second half, I thought that Draymond Green was an absolute critical piece of the Warriors slowing down the Kings and coming out with a 14-point advantage in third-quarter play. So to me, great adjustment made by Steve Kerr going into the third quarter. I thought that Draymond Green's defense, specifically during that stretch, was outstanding. It was throughout the game. He had that huge block on Sabonis. Just in the last couple of minutes of the fourth quarter, I think under two minutes remaining, he did a little flex on Sabonis. I personally enjoyed it after, you know, some of the Sabonis antics early on in the season. I didn't dislike seeing him get blocked and go down to the floor uh, there for a moment, of course. Mm-hmm. Glad everyone's okay, but still, it was a great block. And I think that Draymond was absolutely critical. The numbers show he continues to be the engine that's, that fires up this defense. Not a great shooting game, but otherwise contributed in so many other ways that were huge to this Warriors performance. Absolutely. Uh, When we come back, we're going to talk about uh, that Steph timeout call. I mean, that was very uncharacteristic of him. But to me, that was part of a a few miscues. by. by, I Actually, I'm going to blame Steve Kerr a little bit, and I'll explain why. Uh, This, In my humble opinion, this should not have been a one-point game. The Warriors should have won this game by 10+. plus. I, I, a few people in the chat said that as well, and I agree. I'll explain yeah. why. We'll see if Kylan agrees with me or not. Uh, first, got to give some love to a couple sponsors. This is a, t- a two-advertiser uh, break here, uh, which means that hopefully the company's rolling. Uh, let's start with uh, uh, prize picks. Here we go. All right, prize picks. Uh, one of the, in my opinion, one of the funnest uh, uh, daily fantasy sports apps you can play. It's all about individuals and over-unders. Uh, for example, if you had bet the over on Stephen Curry tonight, you probably would have won. Stephen Curry finished with 32 points. I believe he was a uh, uh, plus minus 29 and a half. That's at least what he usually is. I didn't get a chance to play today. Uh, and that's what it's all about, whether it's over-unders on points, rebounds, assists. It could be different sports. You can make. You have to uh, bet on a minimum of two players. One of those could be, let's say, Steph. One of those could be an MLS player. Who, who's the most... Uh, popular or uh who's the biggest star in the san jose earthquakes kylan like who, who could be someone we could bet on from the earthquakes uh, jeremy bobacy is their striker however christian espinosa has been the biggest star of the season one of their wingers who i think has six goals now on the season there you go well then i could have uh, bet on an over under on one of those two players in terms of goals uh and then bet on steph for the over under that's how price picks works it's super fun it's super easy uh download the price picks app now or go to pricepicks.com to sign up and play daily fantasy sports first time users receive a 100 deposit match up to 100 bucks with the promo code locked on if you deposit 100 bucks they give you 100 it's that simple but you got to enter the promo code locked on at sign up for an instant deposit match up to 100 today's episode is also brought to you by nissan and more specifically the nissan aria uh, and every time we mention Nissan, we're also talking about Nissan's most electric player of the week, which is brought to you by the all new, all electric 2023 Nissan Aria. Kylan, who do we settle on again? We settled on drum roll, please. Clay Thompson, <laughs> Clay Thompson, who, uh, had a fantastic game tonight, uh, led the team in plus minus plus 22 finished with 26 points. A nine of 15 from the field, uh, just shy of 50% shooting from three was four for nine 
uh, but just played a lot of tough inside minutes. In, in case people aren't watching closely, uh, Clay's also defending Sabonis on a lot of these plays. And he's, given the, the, the size mismatch, doing a marvelous job, in my humble opinion. So, Clay Thompson, you are uh, the Nissan Most Electric uh, Player of the Week. Uh, you were electric. You were brilliantly fierce. You were stunningly powerful. The 2023 Nissan Aria packs pin the year to your seat. Power and premium intelligence, all in one electric vehicle. The all new, all electric 2023 Nissan Aria, the electric vehicle for people who love to drive. Shop now at NissanUSA.com. <laughs> Your daily Golden State Warriors podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you for making Locked On Warriors your first listen every day. We're free and available wherever you get podcasts and every dayers uh, tomorrow on the show. Don't know yet, but regardless, right now we're focused on the here and now. We're celebrating the Warriors with a huge 126-125 victory at the last second over the Sacramento Kings to even this series. You can follow Kyla Mills on all social media platforms, uh, including Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter, at Kyla Mills. I don't know what Bruce Mars is referring to, saying a lot of fans are walking out to, to see tickets on their cars. <laughs> Yikes, they are pissed. Uh, follow up with that, please. I don't, I don't understand what's going on. Uh, I, I, tweeted out, I tweeted out before the game because I actually dropped Charlie off at the game. Yeah. He was covering it today. We just got back from our vacation, so I had no interest in going. Um, but he, there were, I saw 14 different uh, like meter maids or like the little parking citation vehicles. Oh. You know, have you seen Oof. the little ones? They kind of look like enclosed golf carts. 14. I counted 14 just like dropping them off and going around the block by Chase Center. And it was an absolute madhouse, like an hour and a half to two hours before tip. Plus, the Giants are at home, uh, first pitch at 410. So then you got oh. some of those folks starting to crowd that same area yeah. um, over by Oracle. So I don't know. I'm assuming Bruce is referring to something like that. But the parking situation in general at Chase Center is not great. Oh. Warning oh. to anyone, if you intend on going to any of these playoff series, uh, it's brutal. They When they built that, they did not plan for enough parking for fans. Add in, you've got the Giants down the street. Um, there are metered spots all up and down the street, but those get taken quickly, and then you've got to keep up with the meters because they were ready to ticket and tow people for sure. Ooh, even on a Sunday, that is so brutal. And It is brutal. Yeah, and it's rough because uh, at least every time I go, I park in parking lot A, which is the parking lot also for the San Francisco Giants. Yeah, I can't Giants. imagine how how difficult things are. You're right. That's the exactly. one thing they did not really think out. Even for media, like w when the Warriors were in Oakland, no media Colin, you and I could just roll up that, you know, that, that huge parking lot, uh, media don't get parking no more. That's a huge reason why I don't go, man. We're not comped or at least I'm not. Um, yeah. so yeah, you got to pay that 40 bucks or deal with the, the meter maids. Is that what they're called yep. now? The, the, the meter enforcers, whatever their title. Yeah. Is. Whatever. Like I said, I don't know. Whatever <laughs> I don't, it was don't a little like anyone. parking citation vehicle people all over the place, <laughs> yeah. like all over, but. Yeah, so hopefully you don't have a ticket on your car, unless you're a Kings fan, of course, then then ticket them away. Um, so uh, th th that Stephen Curry play, the Warriors were comfortably in the lead late in the game. Uh, the score was 126-121, and then Stephen Curry uh, calls a timeout. The problem is they're out of timeouts. Um, the reason why I, I kind of don't want to uh, absolve Kerr from that is why were you out of timeouts? I, that's, I, I don't recall. It's been a while since I, I remember a Warriors game where with that much time left on the clock, I think there was like 42 seconds. Uh, uh, I'm trying to look at the play-by-play the -play in terms of when Steph called that timeout. Um, and I think it was at the 42-second mark. They led 126-121. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, whether it was poor communication in terms of relaying that to Steph, because St I've never seen Steph make a mistake like that. Steph doesn't make mental mistakes. Um, it was very shocking seeing that. And so part of me wondered, like, did they communicate effectively to Steph that, that in fact, the team was out of timeouts? Why were you out of timeouts when there was that much time left on the clock in such a close game? That mistake almost cost the entire dynasty. I mean, if the Warriors lose this game, they are in such a bad position. I mean, we're talking about the end of everything. Down 3-1, a chance for the Kings to close them out in game five. It's amazing how close this game was. So regardless of, of the fact that Steph called the timeout, you know, I, I, we'll have to hear from post game. You know, hopefully someone asked Steph or Kerr about that. But here was the bigger issue that I had with Steve Kerr today. And, and let me know what your thoughts are on both these. 
I don't. I didn't like the fact that in the second quarter, the Warriors were up. Uh, no, it was first quarter, I think. Uh, the Warriors were up twenty-eight to twenty-one. They were in control of this game. They're they're rolling. Uh, Draymond comes off the bench. Everything's still going fine. And then uh, Mike Brown goes to his bench players that have been really succeeding throughout this entire series. And the players I'm referring to more specifically are the seven footer Alex Len, um, and then players like Trey Lyles and Malik Monk, who and Monk especially has just been wildly successful this entire series. But what I don't understand is why Steve continues to have this aversion to match Alex Len with size. And, and whether that's Jermichael Green, who I thought had a solid game three, whether that's Jonathan Kaminga, who finished this game with only two minutes and 51 seconds of play, whatever it is, you've got to bring some size in there. I, I felt like a huge matchup advantage the Warriors had in game three. We're seeing larger, more athletic players in Jermichael Green, Jonathan Kaminga, even Moses Moody, who tonight only played five minutes, 22 seconds, despite having some terrific games in this series. I don't think this game should have been as close as it should have. 126, 125 is absurd. They almost lost that game. If Harrison Barnes, now granted, thank the gods that it was Harrison Barnes taking that three, because anyone who's watched the Warriors knows that dude is his one kryptonite or is three point shooting. He can't, he's a brick machine when it comes to shooting threes. So seeing him shoot it was a massive relief, but it came that close. I I I don't I just I don't know. That, that was way too hairy for me. Kyle, and, actually, do you mind if you give your thoughts when we come back from the break? I don't realize sure. how late we were. Yeah, we okay? can do it after. But you might have to team me up again so I can remember everything you just said. But yeah, yeah <laughs> I just break. I just want to talk about the. the I just want you to address uh, Kerr substitutions and, and his yeah. minute distribution and what your thoughts were on how he handled that. Uh, when we come back, we'll get Kylan's thoughts. I was talking way too much there. First, we got to give some love to Ultimate Basketball GM, a super fun app that you can play where you're basically. Uh, putting on the shoes of Bob Myers or, or whoever your favorite GM is, you are become the GM of a basketball team. And look, if you're looking for an app, a game that's super fun, that burns time, where you just need a distraction from the mundaneness or the difficulties of life, and you love basketball, Ultimate Pro Basketball GM is the game for you. And Locked On Warriors listeners get a 100% free boost to their franchise when you use the promo code Locked On in the game store. So make sure to check it out. To download the game, just visit probasketballgm.com, scan the code right there, or look it up on the app stores. That's probasketballgm.com, Ultimate Basketball GM. Start your dynasty today. You are Locked On Warriors, your daily Golden State Warriors podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you for making Locked On Warriors your first listen every day. And everydayers, follow the program on Twitter at Locked On Dubs to find out who we have on the show next, what time we're on next. So follow us on Twitter there. You can follow Kylan Mills on Twitter and Instagram and TikTok at Kylan Mills. Kylan, uh, I have a chat question published right now from Foul Sharpton. He published this earlier and I started because I agree with it. Uh, Foul Sharpton writes a one point win when it could have been 10. I agree. I'm still not a fan. I thought Kerr made great adjustments in game three. I did not see that similar brilliance in game four. I thought Dante DiVincenzo maybe played a little too much. Didn't think Moody played enough. Would have liked to see Jermichael Green in the game. Uh, would have liked more minutes for Kaminga. I think changes like that would have made a difference and would have given the Warriors a more comfortable uh, margin of victory. Your thoughts? Uh, I disagree. I don't think the margin of victory necessarily was on Steve Kerr. Um, in terms of playing Kaminga or not, or you mentioned some of those uh, early first half minutes when some of the second unit from the Kings came on and in regards to Len, who does bring in size. To me, Jonathan Kaminga hasn't been doing much in the series. He has not been performing up to the level that we saw him perform at even during the regular season. One of the main things that Jonathan Kaminga needs to work on in my eyes is rebounding. He has not rebounded well at all this series. The Warriors have to be battling or they have to win the rebounding battle or at least be close in order to be competitive with the Kings. The times where we've seen the Warriors trails when they're getting beat up on the boards and especially giving up O boards. Jonathan Kaminga hasn't been rebounding flat out. So I think he's a liability in that regard because you need someone who's going to crash the glass and mix it up. Um, I know there was one time where Jonathan Kaminga did come in 
early in the game. I can't remember what exact minute it was, but maybe second quarter, Andrew Wiggins took a corner three and it missed and it hit off kind of like the front of the yeah. iron and it went long and it bounced towards Kaminga and he just was slow. Like you yeah, absolutely have here. to anticipate the miss. And to me, it should have been Kaminga's rebound. Like it bounced like right towards him. And then his reaction time was just so slow. He was just kind of standing out at, you know, where he had been posted up on the three point line and just watch. To me, he was ball watching and several of the Kings players were able to react quicker and jump in before he was and get the ball. And to me, that's a little bit of the microcosm of some of his problems in terms of rebounding. He's got to be more anticipating misses and he's got to be crashing the glass harder and not ball watching. Um, So to me, Jonathan Kaminga struggles on the boards have to improve for him to earn more minutes in the series because the rebounding battle is so critical with the Kings. So I don't necessarily blame Steve Kerr. Um, I just don't, you know, I don't think I've seen what I need to see from Jonathan Kaminga to play his way into the rotation versus a Moses Moody. When he's been in the game, he's come in and really grabbed, you know, the minutes that he's been given. And I think that he's been doing what he needs to do to play so aggressively and to earn himself more time. I haven't seen that from Jonathan Kaminga. So I don't blame Steve Kerr for not giving him uh, more minutes in this game or in particular throughout the series. Um, the one area that I think that it's fair to criticize Steve Kerr is, challenging that call against Kevon Looney, the illegal screen that ended up taking away the Warriors last time out. Um, that's where the confusion lied with Steph Curry is because he had challenged that illegal screen that took away the Warriors final timeout. To me, the, Steve Kerr never should have challenged on that call. Um, yeah, maybe it was close, but Looney was moving a little bit, but there was, there's, there just was not going to be the evidence to overturn that. I don't think that's the situation where you give up your final timeout in order to challenge that. It just wasn't the right call to me from Steve Kerr. And based on what he said, I just actually was looking at some tweets to see what he was saying in postseason. Steve Kerr took total accountability for that. And he pretty much agreed with everything I just said. Steve Kerr also took, took accountability in post game for Steph Curry, mistakenly calling that last time out when they didn't actually have one. He said that he should have done a better job. Kerr should have as a coach reminding and telling his players, Hey, we don't have a timeout because that was taken away due to me challenging that loony screen, illegal screen call. Um, so Steve Kerr is taking some of the onus for that last, you know, blunder, whatever you want to call it. However, I do think Steph Curry also being an experienced veteran that he is one of the greatest players of all time. He does also take some accountability for making a mistake, a mental error. Steph Curry should know as a player with a level of experience in clutch playoff situations, how many, if any timeouts you have, you get the ball with 40 seconds left. Also, I think an argument could be made that you don't necessarily need a timeout, but had you had one, I do think that's a situation where you could take one, but you know, it's also on Steph Curry, I think, to know in that situation, do we have a timeout? Do we not? I think it's a shared responsibility and a shared blame for how that went down. Steph Curry absolutely made a mental error. Steve Kerr also, I think, should not have challenged on the loony legal screen and then also should have been very clear with his players. We do not have a timeout. And that had to be communicated. Yeah, um, I'm going to push back on the Kaminga thing and I'll tell you why, because I, I still maintain, I don't think any player should be judged in, in three minutes of play, two minutes of play. Uh, the, the one, I do agree that, that it was a bad look on the one uh, miss basket that he was just standing there as the ball was just bouncing toward him and not doing anything. That was inexcusable. I totally agree. Um, I will add, though, that was for an offensive rebound, not a defensive rebound. And a huge reason why his rebounding numbers aren't as big as people would like, given he's 6'8" is he oftentimes defends perimeter players. He's usually not in a position to be grabbing rebounds. And per 36 minutes, his rebounding numbers are still above P.J. Tucker's, are still above Paul George. It, it's, I don't know, I just hear that criticism of rebounding, and I started doing a lot more research on it. His numbers aren't as bad as people say. Uh, you know, he's 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 not a typical 6'8 player, whereas he's oftentimes given the same type of defensive assignments that Gary Payne II gets. Like, like in this series... He's often defending Darren Fox. He's often defending Herder or perimeter players. Um, I'm looking at like the, the box score for the games he's played this series. And in the two games where he's actually played 10 minutes or more, he actually did okay. In game one, uh, he played 10 minutes, um, was uh, an, it scored eight points, uh, was an even in terms of the plus minus on a night when most players were in the negative. And then in game three, in a game they won, he played 13 minutes, uh, was a plus six, scored six points, grabbed two rebounds. I just I have a hard time just accepting criticism of players who are judged in just two minutes of play. I mean, I just don't think that's fair. I, I don't you know, I every time he plays extended minutes, good things happen. I can't think of a single game where he's given like a long run where you regret it, where, where Kerr is criticized for playing him too long. He just gets his short leash. I just 
I why not Moody and Kaminga? You know, like I, I agree with you on Moody, but I, I just don't understand this quick leash on Kaminga. It does nothing for his confidence. He's a long athletic player. Every time he plays, good things happen. And that's where I'll push back. I don't know. Any thoughts from you? Yeah, I mean, I just think looking at the rebounding numbers, they just weren't good. And to me, that's where there's got to be more effort and intentionality from Jonathan Kaminga. Um, I don't buy what you're selling in regards to his defensive assignments, not allowing him to rebound. Like Dante DiVincenzo defends the perimeter and pulls in seven, eight rebounds a night. So I think it's an intentionality thing. It's an effort thing. It's a mentality thing. And to me, Jonathan Kaminga hasn't brought it in the series. I agree with you that throughout the season, when given extended minutes, Jonathan Kaminga has played outstanding. He has been brilliant in moments i don't think he's consistent yet and i think that he Mm. needs to do something when given the minutes for example 13 minutes in in game three and i don't think there was any moment to me that stood out as wow jonathan kaminga really came out here with a fire with a passion with the aggression the 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 multiple dunks that that made the crowd erupt you forgot about all that but once again two rebounds there's got to be more there's got to be more a couple of dunks you've got to do more than that to me how many rebounds is a good amount for you considering he put 13 minutes, two rebounds in a 36 minute game. That's six rebounds. I mean, so what, 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 how many are you looking for given the, the very few minutes he plays? Like why More. this focus on rebounds so much? More. Well, because like I said, rebounds has been the critical piece to me of this series. When the Warriors have been able to battle rebounding wise with the Kings, they are able to be competitive when they're getting beat up and they give up so many second chance points on the offensive glass, especially then they struggle. And to me, when you bring in a sub off the bench, they don't have a lot of size off the bench. When you bring in a Jonathan Kaminga who has the size, you want to see him be super effective and efficient in rebounding. I also think beyond the series, it's an area that Jonathan Kaminga could improve at throughout the season. I think there are times where even when he's gotten bigger minutes and he's played well, he still hasn't quite got the rebounding piece together. Um, so to me, I just think it's been a lack of intensity. I think I'd like to see a little bit more effort from Jonathan Kaminga attentionality when it comes to rebounding and you know i don't think he did anything special to me today that warranted hey give him a lot more run i well, thought that the warriors made some good adjustments i liked what i saw in the third quarter and i think that does have to give some credit to the coaching staff for the rotations that they rolled out but again i so you think it's fair that in you, that you judge a player in two minutes and change that you give him a yank and not see him again that one play is enough to, to not see him again for the whole game you look at every measurable Every measurable turnovers, shooting percentage, again, rebounds for 36 minutes were actually solid. He'd be averaging close to six rebounds a game if he was actually playing starter minutes. And that number would probably grow if he actually got the experience to become a better rebounder. You really think it's it's fair to judge him on in two minutes of play? I think that you can judge him based on the play throughout the series. He's played more than two minutes before today, and I don't think I've been impressed with Jonathan Kaminga throughout the series. I don't think it's fair, as I've said all season, to judge any of the young players on two minutes. And I have absolutely agreed with you that I think a lot of the players have had too short of a leash. I just don't think playing Jonathan Kaminga an extra five minutes, six minutes, seven minutes would have made the difference in this game. I really don't. I don't think he's been the difference maker in any game of the series, whether when it comes to deciding the win or loss. So to me, I know you're talking about, hey, it should have been a bigger margin. I don't think that Jonathan Kaminga playing an extra eight minutes or 10 minutes would have necessarily been the difference. That's that's just my take on it. And, you know, I'm going to stick by that. No, that's fair. All I'm saying, and and my response is, in the, the they played four games so far, and the in the two games where Kaminga's played ten plus minutes, uh, the, it was the closer game on the road. They barely lost that game by three. It was the blowout victory at home, and then in the games where we don't see them, it's a one point victory at home, and it's an eight point loss on the road. I don't think these are coincidences. Um, I you know I I don't think it's fair at all that we're judging him on two minute spurts. Um, sometimes players need to rev up and and get their motor ro- uh, 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 rolling in a game to actually be effective. I just do not think this is helping at all. And again, what I saw in game three was a team that was giving minutes to Moody, Jamichael, and Kaminga, three of your biggest, longest players. And you saw the Warriors dominate that game. They won by 17 points. They were in control from beginning to end. Tonight, you have a game where the 6'9", Jamichael Green gets DNP'd. The 6'8", Jonathan Kaminga gets two minutes and is yanked. And it's a one-point game. They barely squeak by. I don't think it's a coincidence that this is happening. 
Um, you know, but I, I don't. I, See, I think the Warriors were leading late in this game. They could have won by more than one point. That you know, in a way that had nothing to do with those players. I, you know, yeah, reeling but, a couple of those turnovers. Steph Curry doesn't make that mistake. They don't get the technical, and they still would have won by five. So I don't. You know, I think you have a point, and I'm not disagreeing with it in its entirety. I just don't think that was the difference in this game, and it being a one point game versus a five point game versus a six point game, etc. And I've agreed with you that I think the Warriors need to use their size in this series, especially given some of the King subs. I just think in this game, when you look at their performance, the Warriors did enough to win by more than one point with the players that were out there in those rotations. Yeah, I mean, but yeah, I mean, they're, they're, they trailed a lot. They, they just shouldn't have been that close. I mean, the Stephen Curry mistake was was tragic and, and it definitely brought the Kings back. But I, it shouldn't have even been a five point game. Like you look at game three and what they did there. If something works, why not replicate it? I, you know, like Dante DiVincenzo played 16 minutes and clearly he was not feeling it tonight. He made that huge three late in the game, which was huge, but he was a minus 11 in the plus minus, um, you know, and he was three for four. I'm sorry. He was uh, just one for three from the field. We had that game in game two where he had zero field goal attempts. I, I feel like if DiVincenzo is not feeling it, you, you can give him the yank fairly fast. He's not having a great series. Uh, grab two rebounds. Um, you know, I, I don't know. Um, anything else you feel like we should be touching on? We need on? to move uh, on. We need to move on. I yeah, mean, yeah. Now we're uh, kind of out of time for the day, but that yeah, was just, exactly. That wasn't, we able to I don't. Right? I don't think that was the rotation thing. Was not the biggest issue in this game to me. Like I don't think we should have spent that much time on that. Fair enough. But then, so okay. So why do you? So what do you think then? I'll ask you this. What do you think was the difference between Game Three where the Warriors won, won by seventeen and Game Four where they won by one? Well, like I said, fourth quarter execution to me was a huge problem in this game. I think turnovers, a big area where we saw them really cut back 20 turnovers in game two, just 11 turnovers in game three. I think taking care of the basketball is going to be critical for the Warriors. They came out in the first half. They could not stop the Kings defensively. They have to be able to come out and everyone needs to own their matchups, play good team defense, and then play solidly in, on the boards. I think that those are the keys to the game when it comes to this matchup and what we've seen so far in every single game of the series. And then to me, the Warriors have had a solid or more solid lead going into the fourth quarter. It was some of that late game execution, a couple of untimely turnovers. I didn't like the challenge once again on Kevon Looney, the mistake in terms of the uh, false uh, call by the false timeout by Steph Curry when they didn't have one. Um, so to me, I think it was just like a couple little things you need to clean up. They want to play better defense, stronger on the glass, more Steph Curry shots in the first half. That to me was the issue and why they were trailing by four at halftime. They came out huge in the third, but if you clean up some of those things in the first half, I think the Warriors could have run away with it. Turnovers. Don't be stupid with the ball. Give the ball more to Steph Curry. Steph Curry only had eight shots in the first half. I want to see more Steph Curry early in games. He needs to be taking over and lighting it up more than he was in the first half of play. Before like two minutes left in the first half, he'd taken maybe six shots. More Put the ball in Steph's hands more. And then rebound, rebound, rebound. You cannot give up second chance points to the Kings. So to me, in this game, that's where those some of those little things you can improve could have potentially made this a bigger leap. Yeah, uh, and, and again, I'm, I will go to my grave saying that Jermichael Green, Kaminga, Moody getting significant minutes is the difference. Another another uh, stat to point out between games three and four, they had 11 turnovers in game three, just one more turnover tonight, uh, 12. Um, the rebounding battle tonight, they actually did uh, solid. Um, they It was an even 44-44. Uh, all of the Kings did out-rebound them offensively 12-8. Um, any other stats that stuck out to you in this game uh, between the two teams? So the Warriors ended up doing a better job in the second half, but like those offensive boards are an area they were trailing seven, nothing at halftime. The Kings had seven. Um, they had seven. I can't remember what the second chance points were, but they had seven offensive boards. So like, that's an area to me where the Warriors have to be super intentional with rebounding. They cleaned it up and they were able to even that, or at least make it a little bit closer. And I think the reason why they were competitive is because they were competitive on the glass with the Kings in this yeah. game. Yeah, and Kevon Looney, I got to give him love. 14 rebounds in this game, uh, 12 of those on the defensive glass, and Draymond Green out of 10 and himself. Uh, Draymond, I thought, just was fantastic defensively. I was very impressed with what he showed. Um, I don't know when the next game is. When is game five? Do you know? Game I don't have a schedule in front of me. <laughs> five. I'm not positive. I don't have it in front of me either, but I believe Tuesday. Uh, this is what happens when we just jump on, like, right after. Um, is it Tuesday? Is that game five? Wednesday. It Wednesday. Is Wednesday. I was going to say, I'm not positive. I was say it's Tuesday. There right? we go. So, so game five, it is now a best of three. Uh, game five is Wednesday, April 26th. Uh, it'll be 7 p.m. tip in Sacramento. The game is on TNT, a game 
I feel is a must win for the Kings. Although if you're if you're a member of Dub Nation, I sure as you know what uh, would want to take that game and try to finish this in six. Do not give the Kings any any reasons to have optimism and confidence. Uh, any last notes, Kyle, before we call it, call it a wrap? Nope. I think that game five is the game where the Warriors need to come out with a lot of fire and they need to put the nail in the coffin early. Do not give this Kings team any reason to no. hope or believe that they can beat the Warriors. If the Warriors come out and jump on them early in this game, I think they're going to put away game five and that leads to winning the series in six. Yeah, absolutely. What a game, man. That was absolutely crazy, but the Warriors come out victorious. Uh, I think it's safe to say championship medal at the end played a part in that, no doubt. Um, it's a best of three. So uh, follow us on Twitter at Locked on Dubs to find out when we're going to be on the air next. Kylan, great to see you as always. Thank you to everyone involved in the chat. Um, yeah, we'll be back at it soon. Take care. Bye.